Our brains can store only 7 bits in its short-term memory. My brain, even less. Now, don't even try to compare your brain with a phone capacity. Not even the one you had back in 2005. A mere byte is 8 bits. That's why you can't even learn a phone number by heart. Our short-term memory functions just like a chalkboard. You can get some info, but sooner or later, you run out of space. To check your working memory capacity, try this test. Ask a friend to write a list of 10 words and read it to you. Most people recall 7 or fewer items from the list. Cats can't taste sugar, as they don't need to because of their meat-based diet. They are some of the few animals on the planet that can't taste sweet things. Speaking of which, you might not believe it, but in this picture, you can see an entire million different colors. Which, when seen in full size, it has 1 million pixels, and each of them is a different color. Although you probably wouldn't be able to name each of them, your eye surely recognizes the differences when seen up close. Nah, go ahead and name each of them. I'll wait. And time's up. Cockroaches are tough. They can survive harsh conditions and have been around ever since dinosaurs ruled our planet. But the termite queen beats all that with a lifespan of 50 years. That's the longest any insect can live. Regular termites live only 1 to 2 years. Some of the strongest muscles in your body aren't in your arms and legs. They're in your head. Masseter is the main muscle responsible for chewing, and it needs to be the strongest for you to eat normally. And you know those muscles that allow you to move your ears? Those are temporalis, located above your temples. They also help you chew your food. Moving away from humans, fleas can jump up to 130 times their body height. To put that in perspective, it's around the same as an average human being jumping over the Empire State Building. Dogs are capable of dreaming, and if you have a dog, it's likely dreaming of you. Research suggests that dogs, like humans, draw on their everyday experiences when they dream. There are watermelons the size of a grape. Cucamelons, or if you prefer, mouse melons, actually look like really small watermelons, but at the same time have a citrus flavor. Mantis shrimp is one of the most colorful creatures in the world. They look rainbow-colored to us, but to those of their own species, they look like a whole burst of colors. Their eyes can detect billions more shades than ours. In Tibet, there are black diamond apples that aren't green or red, but dark purple. The place where they grow has plenty of ultraviolet light over the day, while the temperatures drastically go down during the night, which makes the apple skin get a darker color. Now, when hippos get hot, they ooze a pinkish liquid through their skin. It soon covers their bodies and protects them from sunburns. Yep, hippos come with their own sunscreen. Chickens are the closest living descendants of the T. rex. Really? Scientists compared the 68-million-year-old T. rex DNA with that of 21 modern species and found chickens to be the closest match. Sloths are able to hold their breath longer than dolphins. They slow their heart rates, and they can stay that way for almost 40 minutes. Dolphins have to come to the surface to catch some air every 10 minutes. The starfish doesn't have either brain or heart, and neither does it have lungs. Yet it has hundreds of tiny feet allowing it to walk, and it also pumps water through them through the star's body. The water acts like blood for the creature. Honeybees have two stomachs. One stomach is for eating, while the other is dedicated to storing the nectar they collect from flowers so that they can carry it back to their hive. Dolphins always sleep with one eye open and never fully asleep. This is because their breathing isn't automatic as they need to keep visiting the surface of the water for air. If they slept, they'd just drown. Humans are the only animals whose brain goes smaller. Yup, as we get older, it tends to shrink. It can do so even because of isolation and loneliness. Other animals, even some of our distant cousins from another side of the family tree, like monkeys and chimpanzees, have no problem with that. You can taste garlic with your feet! Mamma mia! Rub a clove right in your feet, take your socks off beforehand, and wait for it. The chemical responsible for its unique smell can be absorbed through the skin even though the clove was never in your mouth. Weird, huh? The alpine ibex is the absolute climbing champion of the animal world. 
Mother goats with their kids seem to be defying gravity by scaling flat vertical cliff walls where no other creature can walk. Male goats, on the other hand, prefer flatlands themselves. Our lifespan is programmed with our cells. They constantly renew and divide, but they have a sort of internal timer that stops at some point. Some cells also stop reproducing sooner than others. On average, cells cease dividing when we reach the age of 100. That means if we find a way to trick ourselves into turning off the timer, we could potentially live forever. Or as long as your money holds out. Reindeer's eyes change color depending on the season. In summer, when the days are longer and lighter, they're brown. But in winter, when it's darker and days are shorter, their eyes turn blue. The blue hue helps them to see in the dark and prevents pressure from building up within the eye. It's caused by the pupils being dilated for so long in the dark winter months. Roosters stop themselves from going deaf when they crow by tilting their heads back. This covers their ear canal and basically acts as a built-in earplug. Their crows produce around as much sound as running a chainsaw. Oy. The Earth's surface is not evenly shaped, which means mass is uneven too. That way, gravity is not the same in all spots on Earth. There's a mysterious anomaly in the Hudson Bay of Canada. The gravity there is lower than in other regions surrounding this area, and scientists believe it's because of melted glaciers. During the last ice age, that region was covered in ice, which is now long gone and melted. But the planet hasn't completely recovered from the icy burden. Gravity over any area is proportional to its mass. The glacier left an imprint that pushed aside a part of the planet's mass, which is one of the reasons why the gravity is weaker in that area. The strongest earthquake we've ever had was in Chile, a magnitude 9.5. If an earthquake ever reached magnitude 12, it could split our planet in half. So let's not do that, please. When sharks need their morning joe, they go to a cafe, too. Back in 2002, researchers found an area in the Pacific Ocean called the White Shark Cafe, where great white sharks come during the winter. They simply hang out, tell jokes and laugh at stories about how many humans they've scared, and then go back to the coast to scare us a little bit more when the weather gets warmer. Octopuses have three hearts, two of which pump blood to the gills, and the third one rolls it to the other organs. Their blood is blue, by the way. And they also have as many as nine brains. One is central, and eight are, you guessed it, controlling their eight limbs. Perhaps this is where the expression thinking on your feet comes from. Orcas are some of the most intelligent creatures on the planet. They hear each other's calls over dozens of miles and have unique calls for every single one of their pod. These calls are similar to human names in function. Well, that's all I have for now. Bye! I have news for you. Rats are ticklish. Well, I thought it was news. Anyway, they have a so-called laugh center in their midbrain, and it activates when someone tickles the animals or when they engage in some fun and playful activities. Scientists discovered this in 2016 after tickling the rodents on their bellies and listening to their squeaky giggles. Now, hummingbirds are the only birds we know about that can fly backward. They mostly do it when they want to move away from flowers. And here's an animal that can't go backward, a kangaroo. They can hop around and cross great distances, but the structure of their strong rear feet and big tails prevent them from walking backwards. Narwhals are those weird creatures that look like some sort of sea unicorns. That horn on their head is not a tusk. It's a giant tooth that sticks out through the upper lip of male narwhals. This tooth is probably one of the tools that plays a role in attracting ladies. Now, flamingos are not actually pink. They're born gray, but throughout their life, they eat lots of algae and other foods that contain a red-orange pigment we know as beta-carotene, like in carrots. This pigment gets broken down and ends up in their skin and feathers, which is what makes them pink. They need to eat a lot of such food to stay like that, though. If we humans wanted to change our skin color, we wouldn't be able to eat enough food rich in beta-carotene to really turn pink, or in our case, maybe even orange. Sloths are really slow. 
All the jokes and memes about them are true, but they're also very skilled swimmers, and they move in the water around 3 to 4 times quicker than on land. They can do breaststroke just like people, and it's an important skill for them to have because they're tropical animals that mostly live in jungles, and those areas are often flooded. Tigers are the biggest members of the feline family, yup, even bigger than lions. And no tiger has the same set of stripes. Their coat is actually a camouflage that comes in handy when they need to find a good spot where their prey won't see them. Interestingly, their skin is striped too, not just the coat. Their stripes are as unique as our fingerprints. Now even though they look kind of funny and innocent, you wouldn't want to bother a platypus. These wild animals are some of the few mammal species that can poison you. They have spurs on the tips of their back feet that can release venom. It's not potent enough to pose a life threat, but the sting can still be very painful and can cause swelling and other issues. When a ladybug needs to defend itself against potential predators, it starts bleeding from its knees. Now, it's not actual blood coming out of its joints. It's a certain chemical that smells bad and, therefore, repels predators. They have another mechanism that helps them survive in the harsh animal kingdom – their specific color. Predators really don't like the combinations of bright colors, such as red, orange, and black, because they know that creatures colored this way can taste awful. Roosters can get extremely noisy in the morning, but they don't go deaf because they don't even hear how loud their crowing can be. What keeps them safe is special built-in noise protection plugs. Hens have the same system that reduces the risk of hearing loss, too. Not only do they have this protection, but they can also regrow cochlear hair ears if they get damaged in only a couple of days. Owls don't have eyeballs. They have something that's more like eye tubes, and they can't move them back and forth like we do with our eyeballs, which is why these birds have incredibly flexible necks. They're able to rotate their heads 270 degrees. For comparison, humans can only manage 180. That's why owls have a specific system of blood vessels in their heads. It delivers fresh blood to the brain if the bird turns its head too quickly and cuts off circulation. Just keep swimming. <laughs> you may remember how Dory the Blue Tang sang this in Finding Nemo. Dory wasn't a shark, but that's a message some shark species need to take literally. Mako sharks, great whites, whale sharks, and some other kinds need to keep swimming. Otherwise, they'll stop breathing. We use our lungs for breathing, and some sharks use a method called buccal pumping. This means they swim with their mouths open. That way, they allow water to flow through their gills and thus extract oxygen. The most dangerous animal on our planet isn't a bear, a shark, or some toothy tiger. It's something way smaller – the mosquito. Not only is it extremely irritating, but it also transfers serious diseases such as yellow fever, malaria, or dengue fever. Annually, hundreds of thousands of people don't survive the battle with those diseases. Mosquitoes also outnumber every other creature across the globe, apart from termites and ants. Grizzly bears are incredibly strong animals with a bite powerful enough to crush a bowling ball. That's why you won't see them allowed in bowling alleys. Despite that, they're mostly light eaters. They're strong enough to make a meal out of whatever they come across, including a bison, moose, or elk. But they still like to munch on their fruits, nuts, berries, and even a small unfortunate mouse that gets lost and ends up in the predator's mouth. The inland taipan is the most venomous snake on the planet. We know it as the western taipan. It lives in Australia. Just one bite has enough venom to turn out fatal for at least 100 fully grown humans. And it can also do the job within only half an hour if you don't have anything to treat the bite right away. They say these snakes are mostly shy and they mind their own business. But like other animals, they will attack if they feel threatened or provoked. There's a kind of turtle that can stay alive for months under the ice by breathing through its behind. When it gets colder, some animals can't find safe places to stay, so they must survive harsh winter conditions wherever they are. And while bees get cozy in their nests and bears sleep in caves, painted turtles stay in their ponds that freeze over. Since the ice limits their access to air, 
they extract oxygen directly from the water and breathe through their behinds. Yes, that would be handy. It's well known that ravens are incredibly intelligent animals. They're excellent at solving problems, but it seems they also have impressive social intelligence. They're very in tune with their feelings as well as the emotions of their mates. If one raven in the group feels pessimistic, it's likely to bring the others down too. A real buzzkill. When they see a bird that doesn't like certain food and expresses it in a very vivid way, they lose interest in their own food as well. The pistol shrimp is one of the loudest animals in the world, even though it's tiny, only about three-quarters of an inch long. When it senses food, it opens its large claw that can grow as long as half its body length and lets some water in. Then it snaps the claw shut extremely fast, which shoots out a very strong jet of bubbles. These bubbles can stun or even finish the prey the shrimp is trying to catch. And when the bubbles pop, it produces a snapping sound, louder than anyone would expect. Crocodiles are even scarier than we thought, because many of them can gallop like horses. They probably inherited this ability from their ancient ancestors, who were as small as cats, had long legs, and could run at speeds of about 11 miles per hour. Smaller crocodiles probably gallop when something's after them. But caimans and alligators obviously don't need to use this skill. It's you who's more likely to gallop away when you see them. And there's the kickoff! Imagine watching your favorite team square up with its rivals. If you're in the stands cheering them on, then it'll be even better to see them run up and down a cool-looking patch of green grass. That's why most pitches have different grass patches for your entertainment. The only player on the pitch who's allowed to touch the ball is the goalkeeper, and you can easily identify them by the different colors of their jerseys. They were asked to wear different colors so that they can pick them out from the crowd. This tradition started more than 100 years ago when jerseys looked slightly different and the pace of the game wasn't as fast as today. The only thing that remained constant is the size of the ball. For 120 years, the football shape and size have not been changed, seeing that this will affect the athlete's overall performance. If you're about to shoot the ball past the goalie, then you would know the exact force, pressure, and spot where to kick it. Athletes train for this ball specifically. Changing it would mean training athletes to figure out a new way of doing things. I mean, there won't be much change if the ball was only slightly bigger or smaller, but this is the sweet spot for the ideal football size. Oh, almost forgot! If you're a US viewer, you of course know that when I say football, you think soccer. Now, ever wondered why they wore jersey numbers? Just like how the goalie can be identified from the crowd, a jersey number identifies a player on the pitch in the sea of other players, and each number represents something. When a player is signed to a club, they have to be registered to a jersey number. While the player can sometimes pick what they want, some jersey numbers are reserved for the specific position they're playing in. A striker cannot wear the number 1 jersey. That number is reserved for goalkeepers only. A striker is a player whose job is to score goals and has a great awareness inside the opposition's penalty box. They get the number 9 jersey. In consecutive order, the numbers 2 to 5 is for defenders who can play in various positions. Numbers 6, 8, and 10 are midfielders who play in the middle of the pitch. In general, they control the game and are the middlemen between defense and attack. You would find them all over the pitch. Number 7 and 11 are wingers. They are the support players for the strikers and also contribute to goals. They're usually fast and tricky with the ball. Traditionally, this is what the numbers mean, but nowadays, clubs don't usually stick to it. Some midfielders can have a number 7, and some defenders can wear a number 6. These days, numbers 7 and 10 are deemed as the most popular jerseys for people to buy and put their names on the back. Now, some clubs have actually retired certain jersey numbers, which means after an incident with a player who wore the jersey, the club will decide not to let any future player wear the jersey number. 
some football clubs also have a reputation for jinxed jersey numbers. This usually happens when a player wears a number 9 jersey and has big shoes to fill after the player who wore it previously scored plenty of goals. The new player might be a perfect striker, but there's something about wearing that new jersey number that makes them get the yips, or in other words, lose their focus. It might be easy for some players to lose focus, especially as they grow older. Now, a football player will start to come down from their peak in their mid-30s. It might not seem that old for other professions, but in sports, particularly in football, 35 years old is considered old and close to retirement. Wow. Expect if you're Kazuyoshi Miura, who plays for Yokohama FC. He's considered to be the oldest professional Japanese football player currently on the pitch. He's 53 years old and plays as a forward in attack. So what? That makes him kind of a geezer in football terms. Football is for all ages and is one of the oldest sports known to us. Even though it's most famously associated with Brazil or England, there is evidence that dates back more than 2,000 years ago. This evidence suggests China was home to the original footballers. But England took the sport, polished it, and made it into the powerhouse sport it is today. They created some rules, including forbidding touching the ball unless you were the goalkeeper and domesticating it to limit the violence. Now, it's no surprise that the oldest football club in the world is in England. Sheffield FC was founded in October 1857 in a city in South Yorkshire. That means the club existed before the tragic accident of the Titanic and before the Eiffel Tower solidified itself as a landmark in Paris. It's no wonder football is the most popular sport in the world. The World Cup ranks in billions of views with the whole world tuning in. The road for any country to qualify is tedious and long. Every country in the world plays. That's right, your country is technically playing in the World Cup. But it all starts in the qualifying stages, which happens over years. Every country plays in the qualifying stages, except a few selected countries and territories. They don't get all the attention and are slowly eliminated until you have the strongest teams from each continent. Fun fact, Greenland cannot host any official football games because of the weather. It's just too cold for grass to grow, which is a requirement from FIFA. Qatar will be the first Middle Eastern nation to host the World Cup, and it'll be the first one to be played during the winter season. The simple reason is that summers in Qatar are just way too hot for attendance and athletes. A regular match is 90 minutes, 45 played in each half with a 15-minute halftime break. During August, teams have a long water break around the 30-minute mark. Summers in Qatar can reach more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and humidity can make it even more unbearable. But the winters are tolerable. This will also be a unique World Cup, considering stadiums will have full air conditioning so that no one feels hot in any way. Terrains and climates can sometimes be to a country's advantage. Brazil and Argentina are, without a doubt, the strongest teams in South America. Of course, you have Chile and Uruguay, which have won some trophies in recent years, but it's always down to the two biggest rivals. However, every country shudders when they visit one of the highest elevated countries in the world, Bolivia. Brazil has lost some games there, even with a star-studded team worthy of crushing even the mightiest of teams. But with such high elevation, oxygen levels are lower, which makes it difficult for Brazilians or any other foreign team to play. Bolivians are used to it, and other teams just have to be really well prepared for the game. Or carry their own oxygen. Oh, you can't do that? Okay, never mind. Brazil has had some of the best players in the world, and it's no surprise that the most expensive player in the world is Neymar. This Brazilian football wizard was acquired by PSG, or Paris Saint-Germain, from FC Barcelona in 2017 for an impressive 264 million bucks, and no player has since then broken this record or has ever been so close to reaching this value. And guess what? They gave him the number 10 jersey. 
Brazilians are known for their flair with the ball and the impressive dribbling skills they bring to the pitch. And it's also no surprise that one of the fastest goals ever scored in a professional football match was a Brazilian. Ricardo Oliveira scored a goal in just 2.8 seconds back in 1998. If you were watching this game live, then chances are you'd miss it, considering that you're still adjusting yourself and probably missed the goal from blinking. I know one thing for sure, I'm going to keep an eye out for Brazil this World Cup. The original Superman from comic books didn't fly. He leaped from one tall building to another in a single bound. But animators who were working on a Superman animated series in the 1940s complained that the whole leaping thing would look silly on the screen. That's how Superman got his superpower of taking off into the air. Just 20% of laughter is caused by jokes and funny situations. The rest is people reacting to questions like, how are you doing? And regular statements. It helps to form social bonds. People who laugh together get closer. We humans are just one of the world's 8.7 million estimated species. This number includes 611,000 mushroom mold and other fungi species, 298,000 plant species, 7.8 million animal species. You've got the idea. There are four main facial expressions, angry, afraid or surprised, happy and sad. But besides these basic ones, you can create up to 7,000 more. By the way, facial expressions that are genuine are more likely to be symmetrical. The mountains on Venus are covered with a snow-like substance, but the temperatures on the planets are scorching and no snow can exist there. The frost is actually metallic. An apple is almost 20% air. That's why it floats when placed in the water. Mysterious Pacific sleeper sharks live in an underwater volcano in Kavachi. It's not far from the Solomon Islands. Scientists have to send in robots to learn more about these creatures. People can't stand the heat and acidity of that environment. The University of Oxford is older than the Aztec Empire. The educational institution was established in 1096 and the Aztec Empire was founded 332 years later, in 1428. The tardigrade, aka the water bear, is a microscopic creature that's famous for its survival skills. It can live through extreme temperatures from 300 to negative 458 degrees Fahrenheit and a pressure that's six times stronger than the ocean floor. The creature can also survive in a complete vacuum. Tardigrades sometimes spend almost 10 years without food. Pluto was discovered in 1930 and lost its planetary status in 2006. Within this rather long time, it still didn't manage to make a full orbit around the Sun. The former planet needs 248 Earth years to complete its orbit. In 400 BCE, Persian engineers built an ice machine in the desert. They noticed that ice tended to appear in the shadows during the night. They started to dig holes in the clay in the shaded spots. Then they filled these holes with water. In the morning, they dug the ice out of the holes and stored it in special super insulated constructions filled with hay. This helped the ice last even on the hottest days and Persians always had something to help them stay cool. Those who cheated in the Olympics in ancient Greece were severely punished. They had to pay fines and could even be banned from any kind of competition. Interestingly, the fines were used to build bronze statues of those cheating athletes near the entrance of the Olympic Stadium with a description of how they had cheated. On average, a drop of water spends around nine days in the atmosphere before it falls back to Earth. And if it ends up in the ocean, it sometimes takes more than 3,000 years before it evaporates again. John Mitchell was the first person to speculate about the existence of black holes. It happened in 1783. In his paper, he called them black stars. Unfortunately, his theory was forgotten until the 1970s. Raw sweet potatoes aren't actually sweet. 
But once you start heating them during cooking, a special enzyme called beta amylase breaks down the tasteless starch, turning it into sugar. The M100 galaxy is 55 million light years away from Earth. This is a mind-boggling distance. The galaxy itself is 107,000 light years across. It's a bit bigger than our home Milky Way galaxy. In 2006, Cutter Telecom had a charity auction where they offered a unique phone number, 666-6666. An anonymous bidder bought it for $2.7 million. Showers are famous for being able to spark creativity. When you're taking a warm shower, you usually feel relaxed and happy. Your dopamine level grows, increasing your chances of getting excellent ideas. The hashtag symbol has an official name, Octothorpe. It's a made-up word that was created in the same place where the telephone came from, Bell Laboratories. Back in the past, when there were no terabytes or even gigabytes yet, megabytes used to weigh a lot. The first computer, which was built in 1956, had a hard drive, or something similar to that. This hard drive's capacity was 5 megabytes, but the cabinet it was kept in weighed around one ton. Butterflies taste food with their feet because their taste sensors are there. If you were a butterfly, you could taste your pizza just by standing on it. Octopuses lay from 20,000 to 100,000 eggs at a time. The mother octopuses doesn't eat for half a year, protecting the eggs. When baby octopuses get born, they aren't bigger than rice grains. A big oak tree can drink 100 gallons of water a day, and a giant sequoia usually consumes 500 gallons daily. The inhabitants of Setenil de las Bodegas in Spain literally live under a rock. People work, study, and go for a walk beneath a huge rocky outcropping. Their homes are built right into the side of the rock. However hot it is outside, you still won't be able to cook an egg on a sidewalk. The highest sidewalk temperature can be more than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But to cook an egg, you need at least 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Concrete is a great heat conductor, but it's not hot enough to make breakfast. There is a sea with borders defined not by land, but by ocean currents. It's the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean, not far from Bermuda. Several currents create a large still area of salty water filled with floating seaweed. Hummingbirds are tiny creatures, but one particular species, the bee hummingbird, breaks all records. The thing is so minuscule, it often gets mistaken for an insect. The bird also weighs less than a dime. Hot chocolate tastes better if you drink it out of an orange cup. Researchers asked 57 volunteers to try the same hot chocolate out of red, cream, white, and orange cups. Almost all the participants agreed that the chocolate tastes better when served in orange cups. It proved that the way something is served influences your perception of its taste. Gravity-defying geckos have millions of tiny branched hairs on their bulbous toes. This system lets geckos stick and unstick their feet at breakneck speed, scurrying across surfaces at 20 body lengths per second. It's a proven fact that when you're on the computer, you blink less. In everyday life, you blink around 20 times per minute. But when you're using a computer, it's only seven times per minute. What's even more interesting, you also read 10% more slowly when you're looking at a computer screen or any other electronic device. African buffalo herds often make decisions by voting. For example, when they choose where to travel, animals would stand up one by one, look in a particular direction, and then lie down again. In most cases, the herd then moves in the direction that's got the most looks. One bamboo species holds the world record for being the fastest growing on Earth. It grows 35 inches per day. When some Massachusetts residents feel like playing a song or two instead of grabbing a guitar, they go for a typewriter. 
In 2004, the Boston Typewriter Orchestra performed for the first time. The orchestra members produced unusual music with the help of old typewriters and have already released one album. The horseshoe crab has eyes all over its body. The creature has 10 of them, some on top of the animal shell, some down on its tail, and the rest near its mouth. All these eyes help the crab get around. Trick or treat! <laughs> Lots of people love the spooky vibes, candies, and creative costumes of Halloween. But let's test your knowledge about this holiday. Comment below how many of these facts you knew before. Black cats have been associated with bad luck for a long time, and this fame is still chasing them. The superstition dates all the way back to the 13th century. Black cats have also been part of the Halloween theme, along with pumpkins, ghosts, witches, and skeletons for a long time. That's why some shelters don't let people adopt black cats during the Halloween season. They worry that these animals will only be kept as props during Halloween, and then they'll be dumped once the season is over. This sad truth made me wonder why people associate the colors black and orange with Halloween. Obviously, most pumpkins are orange, but there are other reasons too. Orange symbolizes fall harvest, and black means darkness. It's a reminder that Halloween once was a festival that focused on the boundaries between life and what's beyond it. Now, that being said, Halloween dates back more than 2,000 years. It originates from a festival called Samhain, which means summer's end. The feast is held around the first day of November to acknowledge the last day of the fall harvest. Plus, people used to think that the boundary between the world of the living and the land of spirits was at its thinnest at that moment. That's where the spirit of Halloween comes from. Now, some people associate Halloween with the Day of the Dead, Dia de Muertos. This Mexican holiday dates back more than 3,000 years. It's the day to remember and honor loved ones who are no longer in this realm. People in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and northern France used to ward off spooks by starting bonfires. They were also wearing costumes to trick spirits. Speaking of tricks, trick or treat has a long history too. This tradition has existed since medieval times. Back then, it was known as guising in Scotland and Ireland. Young people wearing costumes went door to door looking for food or money. In exchange, they sang songs, read poems, or did other tricks. So, how did this festival full of rituals become popular in the rest of the world? Well, immigrants helped popularize the holiday in the US, for instance. When the Irish came to the country in the 1840s, they brought their Halloween traditions with them. The Irish also brought us jack-o'-lanterns. Legend says that an Irish person named Stingy Jack tricked the devil. For that, he was trapped between two worlds. He spent his days wandering around Earth carrying a lantern. Of course, this is a myth, and the reality has more practical and realistic reasoning. Metal lanterns were quite expensive, so people carved root veggies. Over time, they started to carve faces and designs to let the light shine through without embers getting exhausted. It's also hypothesized that in 17th century Britain, it was common to refer to a person whose name you didn't know as Jack. For instance, a night watchman would become known as Jack of the Lantern. Aha! Yeah, there are dozens of versions of the tale about Jack o' Lantern. All of them have different storylines. Feel free to pick one to believe. The largest number of lit jack o' lanterns on display was 30,581. This record was achieved by the city of Keene in the USA in 2013. Keene was the original record holder in this category, but it has been broken eight times since the initial attempt. They're sure passionate about jack o' lanterns. In the US, consumers spent about $9 billion on Halloween in 2019. Most Americans buy candy, decorations, and costumes. But the first prize definitely goes to sweets. As for costumes, there are limitless options, from store-bought classics to last-minute DIY outfits. A study says that the witch costume was the most popular choice among grown-ups in 2021. So, what's your go-to costume? Now, when you look at Halloween decorations, you're likely to see depictions of a full moon beaming. Interestingly, a full moon on Halloween only occurs three or four times each century. 
On average, the moon is full on Halloween every 19 years. Last time, it was seen in 2020. Now that you know this, you can, you know, start the countdown for the next one. Do you know that pumpkins are a fruit, not a vegetable? Basically, anything that grows from a flower is technically a fruit. People carved turnips instead of pumpkins in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They used to carve frightening expressions on turnips, and sometimes beets and potatoes. Not just Halloween itself has spread all over the world. Irish traditional Halloween bread joined along the way. It's called barmbrack, or just brack. It's a sweet loaf with dark and golden raisins. People used to hide small toys or rings in this bread. They believe that whoever found the item would have good fortune in the following year. You better be careful eating this bread, though, if you're not planning to see your dentist in the upcoming year. If you're looking for various types of pumpkins, Illinois is the place you need. It produces up to five times more pumpkins compared to other states. Illinois farms grow over 500 million pounds of pumpkins every year. So, let's assume you've got your pumpkin. How fast can you carve it? Well, the fastest pumpkin carving took only 6.5 seconds. Stephen Clark holds this record. He carved his lantern in October 2013. In order to take part in the competition, the jack-o'-lantern had to have a complete face with the eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. And Clark nailed it. Now, some people love it and others hate it. I'm talking about candy corn. It has become a traditional go-to candy to offer when someone knocks on your door. It was originally called chicken feed. The company used to sell the treat in boxes with a rooster on the cover to give reference to America's agricultural roots. The sugary recipe hasn't changed much since the 1880s, but the packaging has. While most people enjoy the spooky spirit of Halloween, some don't like it for a serious reason. So when a phobia is the fear of Halloween. Now, how about Halloween postcards? Not so many people send postcards these days, but they were popular in the past. From 1905 to 1920, over 3,000 Halloween postcards were mass-produced. Then the telephone became the preferred method of communication. Halloween is often a big event in certain American communities and neighborhoods. During Halloween, neighborhoods would often hold contests for the best decorated house and the most creative and spooky decorations. The next fact is about pumpkin spice latte. Mm. A cup of joy made up of espresso with a mix of traditional spice flavors – cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. You add steamed milk and top it with whipped cream and pumpkin pie spice. It's most commonly associated with Starbucks. The company first sold the drink in the fall of 2003. Despite its spooky vibes, Halloween was once about finding true love. I know this prize is taken by Valentine's Day these days, but there was a time when Halloween was associated with courtship. There was a game where a woman peeled an apple and tossed the peel over her shoulder. The way the peel landed was believed to indicate the initials of the woman's future love. Now, eat, drink, and be scary this year, too. Eh, don't worry. It's not Halloween. She just saw her phone bill. So you just sat down to eat at your favorite restaurant. The waiter comes by the table to get your order of drinks. You've been craving some soda all day, so you order a Coke. The waiter looks really sorry, but he says, It's a Pepsi restaurant. Can you count the number of times this has happened to you? Even when you're traveling abroad, it's either Coke or Pepsi. If you like both, you end up having to pick sides. So how about we get to the bottom of this rivalry? Is one of them objectively better than the other? The first category, variety. I'd say both companies are pretty good at this. You can easily choose between diet, no sugar, and even cherry coke. While with Pepsi, you can even order such wild tastes as lemon, lime, caramel, and even some spicy flavors. The next category is taste. As you probably know, taste is something very personal. There's no right or wrong answer here, of course, but everyone has their favorite. The Coca-Cola recipe has been an intensely guarded secret since 1891 when John Pemberton, the inventor of the drink, sold the recipe. It was then modified by the buyer, Asia Candler, and that's exactly the recipe we know and love today. Meanwhile, Pepsi Sweet Taste was invented by Calum Bradham. Sometime later, Charles Guth purchased Bradham's bankrupt company. 
This guy also owned a candy company named Loft. Can it explain why Pepsi's recipe is sweeter than Coke's? What do your taste buds say? Coke or Pepsi? Now, you've just woken up. You ordered pizza the night before and are ready to have some leftovers for breakfast. You open the fridge and… uh-oh! You're faced with a tough choice – cold pizza or cold pasta. How and why do both of these dishes taste so good when cold? There's actually science behind their amazing taste. According to pasta experts, your spaghetti tastes even better the next day because of that little thing called starch. It's mainly found in cereals and potatoes. To put it simply, the ingredients of these dishes have more time to get to know each other better as they spend the night sitting in the fridge. The starch absorbs the fat and sauce and seasoning overnight. It vacuums all the tastiness and makes the flavor much richer. This goes for both pizza and pasta. I guess it's not coincidence, then, that some people often over-order these types of food just so they can have some leftovers to appreciate the next morning. No, we never do that at my house. Mm -mm. Still on the topic of pizza, I say let's settle the pineapple on pizza debate once and for all. It's true that this is the line that separates many of us. One side of the argument says berries should never go on pizza. Wait, what? In case you didn't know, pineapples are actually berries. A group of berries that have fused together, that is. Now, on the other side, there are Hawaiian pizza lovers. These ones will try to convince you how great pineapple is when mixed together with tomato sauce. It's supposed to add sweetness and freshness to counterbalance the spice of the tomato sauce. So, what do you have to say about that? Yay or nay? Oh, and have you ever tried pineapples on burgers? Yep, they have conquered burgers as well. Some fans say pineapple plays the same role as pickles. It provides that sweet, salty, and tangy flavor that your burger experience is in dire need of. Now, no twin is exactly the same, except when it comes to Twix bars. If you're the one to pick sides, then I guess you've already picked yours. Now, tell me, are you the left Twix or the right Twix fan? Does it make any difference? Or is it all just a genius marketing move? If you've bought Twix over the last years, you've probably been faced with three options. A regular package, a package that is said to contain two left Twix bars, and another one that contains two right Twix bars. Now, as you may know, Twix comes in pairs. But in 2012, Twix's manufacturer Mars took this to the next level. They began to claim that the bars were not identical twins. Through very humorous commercials, Mars gives the consumer the idea that the production process for each bar is different. The story is that the Twix inventors, brothers Earl and Seamus, once reached a breaking point, <laughs> quite literally. They disagreed on chocolate pouring techniques and caramel consistency. So each brother went on to found his own company. For example, in the left Twix company, the crunchy cookie base is cascaded in caramel and bathed in chocolate. While in the right Twix company, the crisp cookie and creamy caramel base are cloaked in chocolate. Now, if you ask me, this sounds like a bunch of synonyms thrown together. Hey, I like synonyms, especially on my oatmeal. Anyway, some excited fans have even gone as far as to fact-check if there are any real differences between the left and right Twix bars. <laughs> it turns out that the left Twix was just a little bit crunchier. And in case you're wondering how that was tested, Let's just say it involved a digital decibel meter. The bars on the left average 72.3 decibels in crunchiness, while the bars on the right average 69.6 decibels. So does that mean louder tastes better? You tell me. Fans think it might be due to the packaging or storage of Twix chocolate bars. They suggest it's less about left versus right and more about top versus bottom placement. The Twix that ends up at the bottom of the package during the production process might be less crunchy. Oy. Now, I'm sure every country probably has some other dilemma. But here in the US, I'd say the main one is the peanut butter over or under the jelly debate. If you've ever been young, <laughs> raise your hand if you were ever in that demographic, then you must have developed a preference. While some responsible grown-up was packing your lunchbox, what did you scream? Jelly first or peanut butter first? People around here have strong opinions on how to make the perfect PB&J sandwich. Some say that the peanut butter lays the perfect foundation for your favorite jelly, while others say that jelly goes first since it's thinner and spreads more easily. Well, the question remains, what side are you on? 
If you had to pick, would you say you are a taco or falafel person? You might be thinking, are these even comparable? And I'll say, oh yeah, they're both great, but serve completely different purposes. Some definitions here. Taco, a Mexican dish made up of a fried tortilla, folded and filled with chili beans, lettuce, and your choice of meat. Falafel, a Middle Eastern dish that is basically patties of ground chickpeas or fava beans, seasoned to perfection, stuffed into pita bread with lots of different sauce toppings. Well, I'm not sure I made my point here, or have I? If this has made your mouth water or encouraged you to run down the street to buy one dish or the other, then I guess I've succeeded. Oh, and in case you don't know which one to choose, just go for a taco falafel. These do exist. And I guess they probably taste great, too. Have you ever stopped mid-sip and wondered, is coffee a soup? Apparently, some people are convinced that coffee is not a beverage, but rather a soup. Now, what makes them think so? According to some fans of this theory, coffee is actually a broth. That's because coffee beans are finely ground and later brewed in water. This process creates an unthickened liquid usually recognized as broth. This theory has its deniers, of course. Those say it doesn't resemble broth at all, as broths usually mean that the liquid has some meal-like value and various nutritional factors. And coffee is… well, coffee is just coffee. It's supposed to taste nice and give you energy. Even if you order the frou-frou versions like low-fat, no-foam, double-shot grande lattes with 2%, like I get. Hey, what's not to like? Now, tell us in the comments below your choice for each of these food battles. Now, there are things about nature that you know for sure. Or don't you? Let's check how much you know about the incredible world we live in. How many of the 14 points will you guess? Let us know! The Great Pyramid of Giza was built when mammoths still roamed the Earth. Myth or fact? It's actually a fact. The most famous pyramid in the world had been constructed about 500 years before woolly mammoths went extinct, approximately 4,000 years ago. Their last known habitat was the cold and deserted Wrangell Island in the Arctic Sea, which might not have been as cold then as it is today. There are more trees on Earth than stars in the Milky Way. Is it myth or fact? It's a fact! Scientists used to believe there were about 4 billion trees on our planet, but more recent studies have shown that there are over 3 trillion of them, making it 420 trees per person. As for the stars in our galaxy, there are only about 100 billion, which is 30 times fewer than the trees on Earth alone. The trees you see are all individual ones, myth or fact. This is false. In fact, 90% of the trees on Earth are interconnected by mycelium filaments. They send warning signals when in danger and exchange nutrients through them. It's kind of like the underground internet. Also, there are organisms like Pando, for example, which is the largest single living being on the planet. It looks like a dense forest of quaking aspens. In fact, it's basically a single giant tree, with its roots being interconnected underground. We drink the same water dinosaurs used to drink hundreds of millions of years ago. Myth or fact? Actually, it is. Only a small portion of the water on our planet has evaporated for good. The rest of it is constantly renewed. So, mammoths, dinosaurs, and whatever came before them billions of years ago drank and swam in the same water we see today. Not to mention what else they did in the water. Unfortunately, the water doesn't keep information about those ancient creatures for us to find out more about them. Lightning never strikes the same place twice. Are you willing to bet on that? Myth or fact? If you aren't, good for you. Lightning may strike the very same spot as many times as it wants. It might seem random, but the electrical discharge from the sky is pulled toward the tallest objects in the thunderstorm area. 
Also, the material this object is made of matters too. It's by no chance that lightning rods on buildings are mostly made of copper and aluminum alloys. These metals are some of the most conductive materials, so they pull lightning very efficiently. All deserts are hot. Now this one's easy, right? Myth or fact? If you guess it's a myth, then right you are. Deserts are qualified not for their temperature, but for the presence or absence of growth and life in them. The most well-known desert is the Sahara, of course, and it is indeed very hot. The actual largest desert in the world is Antarctica, which is almost twice the size of the Sahara Desert. And you wouldn't call it even lukewarm. It's a polar desert, and there are several others on our planet. For example, Greenland. There's enough gold underground to cover the entire planet in a thick layer. Would you believe that? Well, you should, because it's true. Since 1950, humanity has mined nearly 200,000 tons of gold. If we made a cube out of all this metal, it would be 70 feet high and wide. Recent data from scientists confirm that there are huge reserves of gold in the Earth's core. The metal is enough to cover the whole planet, and people might have gold up to their knees. The problem is, we just can't mine it from there. Hey, I don't mine if you don't. The Moon and Mars are better mapped than the Earth's oceans. Now, this can't be true, can it? Actually, it can. We have a detailed map of the Moon and Mars, although we're still discovering surprises on their surfaces granted. Still, over 80% of the Earth's oceans are unmapped and unexplored. We can't study the oceans properly because of pressure, cold, and lack of light underneath billions of tons of water. The lava is always red. What other color can it be, right? Myth or fact? Myth. Usually lava is really red or orange because it's basically molten rock from the deep bowels of our planet. But there's one volcano in Indonesia whose lava is blue and luminescent. Only at night, though. During the day, it looks normal. No mystery about it, just tons of sulfuric gas. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. But you probably guessed you should never do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, the largest blue fire in the world, rising up to 16 feet high. Ever seen a gas stove burning? Here, the principle is basically the same. You can see a rainbow at night, too. Is it myth or a fact? It's true. And there's even a name for this phenomenon, a moonbow. Also called a lunar rainbow, this event occurs extremely rarely. It's similar to a regular rainbow, except when it appears on a clear moony night after a rain shower. There's a thing called a fire rainbow. Myth or fact? You bet! It's a beautiful phenomenon when the clouds in the sky are painted all the colors of the rainbow, looking like a fiery, multicolored cascade. It only occurs when the conditions are right, and those are very specific. It's close to the equator, the weather is clear, there are feather-like clouds in the sky, the sun is higher than 58 degrees above the horizon. Such clouds are made of ice crystals. When the sun's rays hit them, the particles refract the light and create a rainbow. Wow! There are rainbow trees. Myth or fact? If I made you doubt this, I'm glad, because this one is not Photoshop. This is the rainbow eucalyptus, and their bark may literally have all the rainbow colors. These eucalyptuses shed their bark at different times each year. Every time the old section goes off, the tree first reveals bright green bark that was hiding underneath. 
And then, it may turn any color. There's a whole set of hues. Orange, maroon, blue, even purple. Stones can move on their own. Myth or fact? Well, you'd be right to believe me. There's a desert plain in California where rocks move around of their own will. Once this plain used to be the bottom of a lake, but then it dried out and became an arid wasteland. Sometimes, rains fall here, flooding the entire valley. When night comes, the temperature drops and the water is covered with a thin layer of ice. When it gets warmer again, the ice breaks into segments and the wind pushes them around the place. Some of these ice shards take small rocks with them. When the ice melts for good and the water evaporates, the only thing that remains are trails left by the rocks, as if they'd moved on their own. Mud puddles can move around. Myth or fact? In fact, a single mud puddle in the world also travels as it wants, and nobody still knows why. It moves at a pace of about 20 feet per year, and it seems to have started its journey near the San Andreas Fault in California. People have tried to stop its march, but couldn't. So far, this creeping natural disaster isn't showing any signs of stopping on its own, either. So, there's your pesky, problematic puddle to ponder. Poor Pete. Pete is so scared of bugs, all he wants is to find a place on Earth where he can be safe from them. After years of research and traveling, he eventually finds the place to go – Antarctica. Pete makes it there, confident that bugs wouldn't survive in the cold. Ah, oh, Little did he know that insects are on every continent of this planet. Well, not really. He was kind of right about Antarctica. It isn't home to a lot of bugs. In fact, there are only one true species of insect that calls this place home. It's a wingless midge called Belgica Antarctica. This fly is tiny, but it's still Antarctica's largest terrestrial bug. Okay, so we've established there's literally no place on Earth you can escape insects. Well, that's not really true either. You might need to learn to swim, though, as the only place that doesn't have any bugs living within is the Earth's surface covered by the ocean. But why do insects hate it here so much? No one could really come up with a definitive explanation, but some think it's because the oceans lack the plants that insects use for food and shelter. They might as well be the largest network of secret agents on the planet, as insects have ears all over the place. Most of the time, though, these ears are not on their heads. Some have ears on their wings, some on their legs, and some even on their abdomens and necks. A lot of these bugs live pretty lonely lives, but there are some of them that actually have families, like the best beetles, for example. They can form family-like units in which both parents work to raise their young. They also have their own vocabulary and speak to each other by squeaking. Should an insect ever fall from a certain height, does it sustain any damage? Well, the subject is a bit more complex, but let's take ants, for example. They don't take any fall damage, and that's because they're so small. A lot of other bugs can technically fall from a height of miles and still be fine. The explanation has a lot to do with math and physics, which the bugs themselves have no time to study. But to put it simply, they're not nearly heavy enough to impact the surface they hit. As they fall, they don't actually gather speed, they slow down. An ant's relatively large surface area, for that tiny weight, creates a lot of drag as it moves through the air. So it ends up slowing down as it reaches the end of its flight. Speaking of ants, uh, wasn't I doing that? There are about one quadrillion of them on the planet at any given moment. That's about 1.4 million ants per human, calculated for a world population of 7.3 billion people. If we put it that way, it's their planet, right? It's hard to imagine a fruit fly with an astronaut helmet on, but they were indeed the first living creatures to be launched into space. That was back in 1947, when they waved goodbye to the Earth in a V-2 rocket, reached an altitude of about 68 miles in less than 200 seconds. 
They then return to Earth by parachute. Not all insects are that lucky. For example, caterpillars have a total of 12 eyes but are basically blind. Their simple little eyes can only distinguish between light and dark, so they can't actually see a clear picture of what's in front of them. And no, glasses won't help if that's what you're thinking. Some insects actually put a lot of work into their uh, dating life. A good example is the stoneflies, which do push-ups to attract the ladies. Did you know butterflies taste the surroundings with their feet? Heard that right! That's because they have taste sensors on their feet that help them find food. So they stand on a leaf and give it a taste. If they figure out the plant is something that their caterpillars can eat, they place their eggs in this spot. But how do they eat since they can't bite or chew? Well, they use their long tongue, which looks more like a tube called a proboscis. It's basically a straw that helps butterflies to slurp up liquids, like nectar, for example. The ancestors of this crafty creature had lived on this planet way before the dinosaurs themselves. Fossil records show that ancient grasshoppers first came up more than 300 million years ago. Ever heard of bugs that are fans of rock music? Well, in a way, termites do, sort of, prefer this sound. Termites chew away at wood to figure out what kind of wood they have lying around. They use vibrations. Why? Because it helps them find the best source of food. If there's heavy metal or rock music playing, they can choose through the wood faster than at their regular speed. Hmm, do they slow their chewing down with Brahms or Bach? Or just go to sleep? This is one type of insect you'll surely find difficult to see. This master of disguise looks like a leaf. Throughout their existence, they managed to develop this type of camouflage so the predators miss them in plain sight. They can even rock back and forth to copy the movement made by leaves blown by the wind. Nature has its own weather forecasters, the mighty crickets. Well, they work more like a thermometer, if you like. Turns out you can manually calculate the temperature outside by counting the cricket chirps you hear in a minute and then divide it by 4. You should then add 40 to that number you get, and there you have it, an estimated temperature number in Fahrenheit. Crickets even have their own unique song, which they use to attract mates and defend their territory. Yes, music that repels and attracts at the same time. You should consider ladybugs if you're interested in free gardening services. That's because they feed on other insects, some that can actually damage your plants. They can keep fruit flies and other mites at bay. A ladybug might end up eating more than 5,000 insects in its lifetime which adds up to about a year. Let's get into some awesome data about the busy bees. Their wings can beat 190 times per second. Now, I'll do the math for you. That's 11,400 times a minute. What a workout! Well, they do need that strength, since a single honeybee colony can produce around 220 pounds of honey each year. That's a staggering 220 jars. Hmm, it's nature's equivalent of a factory. But you'd have to teach bees to make honey. It's not in their instinct to do so. Another fascinating aspect of bees' life is that the temperature inside any beehive is always around 93 degrees, regardless of the outside weather. That's because they're really good at insulating their surroundings. Bees also have different stomachs for eating and for storing honey. It's the bee's equivalent of not doing business while you're eating. Okay, now don't jump out of your chair just yet, as you might actually enjoy some of these facts about spiders. They do help a lot with maintaining our crops free from other insects. So, if you think about it, we do have something to thank them for. Their eyesight is also incredible. They can see spectrums of light that we can't, like UVA and UVB light. And speaking of their superpowers, a strand of spider silk is five times stronger than a strand of steel, of the same thickness, of course. Some scientists believe that if spiders were as large as humans, certainly hope not, their web could stop objects as big as airplanes. And that spider silk? It's actually a liquid, but it does harden when exposed to air. 
They're also quite sneaky themselves and have evolved to look more like ants. Why? So they can better avoid other predators and hunt ants better. Spiders don't have wings, that's for sure, but the jumping ones can hop up to 50 times their own length. Well, otherwise, I still get the heebie-jeebies when I think about spiders. How about you? The Empire State Building's tower was designed to serve as a docking station for dirigibles. At that time, people believed that these airships would become the main means of transportation in the future. The project included gangplanks, check-in and customs offices, and so on. But then the engineers realized that the wind up there was too strong for their plans, and they gave up on their idea. Angel Falls, the largest uninterrupted waterfall on the planet, is more than twice as tall as the Empire State Building. During the dry season, the falling water sometimes evaporates before it reaches the ground. One of the most mysterious sounds ever heard on Earth was the bloop. It occurred in 1997 and resembled the noise of marine animals. But the volume was too great for a sound produced by a living creature. The bloop continued for one minute. It started from a low rumble and then rose in frequency. Antarctica might just look like a giant field of ice, but there's actually a huge continent underneath. That means that it has volcanoes, mountains, and valleys, like any other continent. Scientists have recently discovered that the Antarctic landmass has the lowest point on the planet, as well as huge mountain ranges. If any of the numerous volcanoes were to erupt, it would melt a huge part of the surface ice and increase the spill of ice into the ocean. The sea level would rise and flood coastal areas around the world. The ocean waters would also be disrupted, putting marine life at risk, though all of these volcanoes are dormant at the moment. Each day on the South Pole lasts six months on this continent. The South Pole only has a single sunset and sunrise across an entire year. Early Earth might have been purple, not green. There's a theory that ancient microbes used molecules rather than chlorophyll to absorb sunlight. These molecules likely gave living organisms a violet tint. During the Stone Age, the entire population of Central Europe was around 1,500 people, which means they would all fit on a mid-sized cruise liner these days. Astronomers have figured out that the Milky Way weighs around 1.5 trillion solar masses, and one solar mass is the mass of our Sun. A tiny part of this weight is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy and 200 billion stars. The rest is dark matter, mysterious and invisible. If all sheets of Arctic ice and glaciers melted at the same time, the sea level would rise for the height of a 26-story building. Under black or UV light, ripening bananas look bright blue. That's because of the chlorophyll that's breaking down when the fruit is ripening. Because of tectonic plate movements, the Pacific Ocean shrinks every year, and the Atlantic Ocean gets bigger by the same amount. These days, there are only two ice sheets in the world left after the planet's last ice age. The first is the Greenland Ice Sheet. The second, the Antarctic Ice Sheet, is enormous. It's the size of Mexico and the continental U.S. combined. Tsunami waves often go unnoticed. They don't rise for more than several inches above the surface until they reach shallow waters. When the ocean is deep, though, they can travel as fast as a long-distance passenger airplane. Corals that live in shallow waters produce their own protection from the sun. Without it, sunlight would harm the algae living inside them. To protect these algae, which are the main source of food for the corals, they fluoresce. This process makes proteins that act as sunscreen. Almost 90% of the volcanic activity on Earth happens in the oceans. The South Pacific has the largest concentration of volcanoes people know about. There's one volcano cluster that has 1,133 volcanic cones. All of them are active and cooped up in an area the size of New York State. The Zemchug Canyon in the middle of the Bering Sea is the largest underwater canyon ever discovered. There are more treasures and artifacts at the bottom of the ocean than in all museums in the world combined. In 1900, one of the biggest hurricanes struck near Central America and in the Gulf of Mexico. It then went as far as Florida and Texas and is considered to be the most devastating hurricane in the United States history. 
They first detected it on August 27th, and it lasted for many days. By the time it reached the Texas coast, the storm had turned into a Category 4 hurricane. Hurricanes are categorized on wind speed and intensity, using something called a Saffir-Simpson scale. There are five different categories from 1 to 5, with 1 being the weakest and 5 being the strongest. The people of Galveston had less than four days to prepare for the arriving storm that even stretched out to Oklahoma and Kansas. The Great Hurricane then made its way to the Great Plains and turned towards the Great Lakes, New England, and reached southeastern Canada. The storm was so bad that more than 3,600 homes were damaged even though they were sturdy enough to withstand the storm. Given the population numbers back then, it was equivalent to hundreds of thousands of houses destroyed, if not millions. Spotted Lake, Canada. They call it the most magical spot in Canada. In winter and spring, this is just a regular lake that looks like any other. But try going there in the summer when the water starts to evaporate. It'll feel as if you've entered a different world, a polka-dotted landscape with blue, green, and yellow spots. Over the summer, there are over 300 pools there, and they all look magical. Over the centuries, people believed each of them had different healing properties. Oh, and the explanation for the vibrant colors is pure science. Each of them has a high concentration of different minerals. We live inside the sun. Its atmosphere stretches far beyond its visible surface, and even though Earth is 93 million miles away from the star, it's still within reach of the sun's atmosphere. Auroras happen when charged particles from the sun get caught by Earth's magnetic field and crash into the upper atmosphere near the poles. Our planet is gradually slowing down the speed of its rotation. It happens at an unhurried pace of 17 milliseconds per 100 years. Because of this, our days are becoming longer, and still, only after 140 million years, a day on Earth will last 25 hours. Earth's southernmost continent, Antarctica, is the only the fifth largest one, but it contains almost 70% of the planet's fresh water and 90% of the world's ice. Antarctica is also considered to be a desert. Lots of rocks on Earth have a Martian origin. Scientists analyze the chemical content of some meteorites found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and other places. It turned out that these rocks had arrived from the Red Planet. The largest sandcastle in the world is located in Denmark. 30 sand sculptors who created it used more than 5,000 tons of sand. To make it more durable, they added 10% of clay, together with a layer of glue. They built it to stand tall against long and stormy winters. Some photons that don't get absorbed are re-emitted, and their wavelength determines the color we see. When you expose a material to sunlight or photons of higher energy, it can damage its chromophores, which is why they won't be able to emit photons at certain wavelengths. Red materials fade in sunlight the most. Their chromophores emit red light in a way they mop up photons of the rest of the wavelengths. From 60 to 100 tons of space dust drift down to our planet's surface every day. These tiny cosmic particles are mostly released by comets, which are usually made of dust and ice. When the sun turns this ice into vapor, the remaining dust travels down to Earth. There are two sides to every story just like to a regular cotton pad. Two different textures, to be more precise. One is smooth, and you're supposed to use it for more sensitive areas of your face, for example, the eyes. The rougher side can help you remove makeup and clean your face in less sensitive areas, like the forehead. If you like having greenery in your home, you've probably noticed the flower pots have holes at the bottom. These holes are the reason your green friends live a happy life. They're extremely important for water drainage. Thanks to these holes, you'll avoid stagnant water buildup that can eventually ruin your plant. Also, thanks to those holes, roots can grow and expand beyond the limits of your pot. Have you noticed aviator sunglasses mostly have green lenses? It has something to do with their origin. First, they showed up in the 1930s. Before that, Pilots had goggles to protect their eyes while they were in the air. High altitudes with glaring sun and sub-zero temperatures were a real test for their eyes. The goggles helped them with those issues, but there was another one. 
Since the temperature differences between the air outside and within the goggles were big, the lenses would fog up and obscure the pilot's view. So the company Bausch & Lohm came up with teardrop lenses surrounded by a light metal frame. These lenses were dark green because this tint cuts out blue light, which is also a problem for pilots when they're flying above the cloud line. Plus, green lenses also reduce glare and improve contrast and sharpness. Holes in the side of your Converse sneakers? Hmm… Are those really necessary? Well, they allow air to enter your shoe so your feet can stay cool. You can also use them to style up your shoes and tie them in different ways too. There are two reasons plastic bottles have grooves. First, if you're drinking cold water and it's hot outside, you'll see there's a lot of condensation on your bottle. Or maybe if you're playing some sport or working out. Your hands are sweaty and if a bottle had a smooth surface, it would be more difficult to grip it, so the ridges are there to improve your hand grip. The second reason is that because of these ridges, manufacturers can use thinner plastic. That means they need less material in overall production. And that plastic is still firm enough for the bottle to maintain its shape. Wooden coat hangers are not just there to look nice. Since they're made of cedar wood, they bring a nice scent to your closet. Plus, they repel bugs. They're also quite firm, so they come in handy for heavy clothes such as jackets. And it's hard to damage them. So they'll serve you longer. You may have noticed there's a colored square at the bottom of your toothpaste. These blocks mostly come in blue, red, green, and black. They are some sort of eye marks, since they help manufacturing machines at the assembly line recognize where and when to cut the toothpaste and seal the end of the tube. Some boots have loops at their top and back. Looks like a fashion statement, doesn't it? Or maybe it's something that manufacturers add for fun. But those loops actually have their purpose. With them, you can pull the shoe up when trying to wear it. Plus, you can easily hang them or use the loop for better support for the laces. Confession time! Remember those attachments your vacuum cleaner came with? Did you also put them somewhere aside and never use them again? They're actually pretty helpful when you're cleaning the house because you can use them for particular areas that are sometimes hard to reach with the regular attachment. We all know what the vegetable peeler is for, but besides peeling the skin of carrots or potatoes, you can use it for onions too. It may be faster than doing it with a knife, plus it will save you some onion tears. Some sweatshirts have something pretty specific in the neck area. A V-shaped stitch you can see in the middle of the collar. The ribbed insert, similar to the ribbing at the hem and the sleeves, would allow the owner to put the garment on more easily and it wouldn't even lose shape. The V insert would stretch so a person wearing the sweatshirt could get their head through the neck. Its purpose was also to absorb sweat. In its early versions, sweatshirts had both the back and the front of the collars. Through time, they lost the back one, and this V insert became something decorative since manufacturers started to stitch a V at the collar without using the ribbed material they had added before. Brightly colored squares or circles you see on food packages aren't an indication of vitamins, minerals, or certain flavors that food contains. And nope, it's not some secret code consumers are supposed to crack. It's actually for printing engineers. They're called process control patches or printer's color blocks. During the process of printing the food packaging, manufacturers use those colored blocks to check if the printing ink is correct. They compare the color of blocks they print to make sure the brand they print for has a consistent and recognizable quality all over the world. The majority of printers only use four colors – yellow, magenta, cyan, and black. Some printers have additional colors, such as green, orange, and violet. That's why you sometimes see multiple circles on certain packages. They test each ink color. Margins in notebooks they're not there as some sort of a guide for taking notes and writing. Someone came up with a potential solution that was supposed to protect the written work from, well, rats. They used to be pretty common residents in people's homes. They are known for their diet, including basically anything, like paper, for example. So, people started adding wide margins as an appetizer that was supposed to keep rats full. 
This way, they wouldn't want to get to the main dish, the written pages. Suits have a buttonhole close to the top of the lapel. Manufacturers sew it shut so you can't open it without ruining your suit. And when you compare it to the other lapel, you see that one is completely smooth, without any clues. You won't find such an unpartnered buttonhole on a suit jacket only. Camp shirts, pea coats, and some other clothing pieces have them too. And they have to do with the history of lapels. The earliest ones showed up at the beginning of the 19th century. Before this, men mostly wear frocks with high collars. They would button them all the way up to the top. During hot days, they would relax the button stance, turn down the collars, and leave the top button undone. It was a relief from the swelter, plus their folded over laps would be symmetrical at the chest, and today, we recognize that as a lapel. People stopped using that buttonhole after they came up with a lapel, unless it was for some formal occasion. Like, for example, when you wanted to put a flower in there. That's why suit makers left it as a fashion feature. Tea bags. It's pretty easy to guess what they're for, but they come in handy if you have smelly feet after a long day in your shoes. Just pop tea bags unused, of course, in your shoes during the night. By the time you wake up, tea bags are going to effectively absorb all the unwanted odors. Binder clips can also have a helpful purpose besides their main one. You can clip your money to keep it together. Same is true for paper clips. If your favorite bracelet broke and you're looking for a way to hold it on, a paper clip might help. Just hook one through each end of the bracelet, twist it tightly, and your bracelet is good to go. The largest sandcastle in the world is located in Denmark. It's over 69 feet tall. 30 sand sculptors who created it used more than 5,000 tons of sand. To make it more durable, they added 10% of clay, together with a layer of glue. They built it to stand tall against long and stormy winters. You can actually spend the night inside a giant potato. The next time you want to get a proper rest in a pretty unique way, you can book a bed inside a 28-foot long, 12-foot wide potato. Well, at least in this cool structure made of concrete, steel, and plaster, that kind of looks like a potato. Teenagers from other decades look different from high schoolers you see today. At first sight, they seem way older, don't they? But it's just because they have a different style. They grew up and kept buying similar clothes they thought looked cool. Now we associate that same style with people that are 50 or 60 years old. So now when we see those pictures from their teenage days, it only feels like they look older. In reality, they just look like the teenagers of today. The same thing will happen with today's teens. They'll keep buying clothes they think look cool when they get older too. That's why future generations will associate their dressing style with old people. Jaguar, Black Cayman, Sloth, Giant Armadillo. There are many different animals you can find in the Amazon rainforest. But was that right there? Rewind a bit. Yep, right in its center, you can find a humpback whale. It's rare to see one even in the middle of the ocean. And it's really jaw-dropping to find one in the middle of the Amazon. And that's what happened in 2019 when local people found a lifeless humpback. The animal probably washed into the river mouth of the Amazon and ended on land when tides pulled back. Elephants have enormous ears, and normally they hold them out to scan noise back and forth. But there are sometimes distant vocalizations and noise they can hear with their feet. When they detect something that's far away, elephants freeze and lean forward. They transfer weight to their front legs and may even lift up a front foot. People often think apple pie originally came from America, but nope. Apples are actually native to Asia, and the first recorded recipe for apple pie appeared in England. When a material fades in the sun, where do you think the color goes? A certain material gets the color from the regions of molecules called chromophores. They absorb photons at particular wavelengths. Photon is the basic unit of light. Some photons that don't get absorbed are re-emitted, and their wavelength determines the color we see. 
When you expose a material to sunlight or photons of higher energy, it can damage its chromophores, which is why they won't be able to emit photons at certain wavelengths. Red materials fade in sunlight the most. Their chromophores emit red light in a way that they mop up photons of the rest of the wavelengths. You're preparing a meal, cutting the vegetables and… Oh no! Here come the tears! We cry when we cut onions because breaking the skin releases enzymes and sulfenic acid. When they combine, they produce a gas that spreads through the air and irritates our eyes. This prompts the tear glands that start producing tears to flush this irritating acid out. Your brain can't perform two things that ask for high-level brain function at the same time. Yep, you can't really multitask. We can't consider low-level functions such as pumping blood and breathing in multitasking. Only those actions you really have to think through. So what you see as multitasking is rapidly switching between two or more tasks. Try to move your feet and hands in the opposite direction. Sit on a chair and turn your left leg clockwise. Draw an 8 shape with your left hand at the same time. Or do the same with the right hand and leg. It seems like your leg changed its direction, right? It's what happens with almost everybody. If you turn your leg counterclockwise, the same will happen. When you get on a roundabout that's spinning really fast, you can feel that strange force, and it seems like it wants to throw you off. Our planet is like a huge roundabout that's spinning in space at approximately 1,000 miles per hour. But we don't feel that spinning force because there's another force acting on our planet and on us. Gravity. It holds us firmly to the ground around 1,000 times more strongly than our planet is spinning and trying to catapult us into space. The toothpaste contains sweeteners because it has detergents that create foam when you brush your teeth, and it needs something that will mask the awful soapy taste they bring. Of course, sugar is out. But there are other sweeteners that do a nice job with covering detergents. These sweetener chemicals attract water. They keep water molecules locked in the toothpaste so it doesn't dry out. Have you ever noticed how you're often less hungry when it's hot outside? All the metabolic processes that are happening in our body, including digestion, produce heat. For every 1,000 calories you eat, your body converts only 250 into energy that's actually useful. The rest of the calories turn into waste heat. When it's hot outside, your body is working pretty hard to keep you safe from overheating. So it doesn't really need the extra heat it generates digesting a big lunch you had. That's why your body kind of dials back your appetite for a while and pulls more energy from the fat reserves it previously stored. Sometimes dreams can seem more vivid when you don't sleep in your own bed. When you spend the night in a hotel or some other place you're not quite familiar with, you experience something scientists call the first night effect. In one of the studies, they discovered the left side of our brain sleeps lighter than the right side during the first night in a new environment. It's probably like this because of an evolutionary mechanism that keeps us alert to potential predators and dangers. There are probably no monsters under the bed in your hotel room, but you wouldn't be so sure if you had lived thousands of years ago. You're also more likely to wake up during your first night in new surroundings. When you wake up a lot, you remember your dreams way better, which is why they can feel more vivid in such situations. You're at work, you just had lunch, and now you're getting ready to finish the final task for the day. But you just can't. You got such an energy crash you want to lie down and take a nap to feel alive again. This can be because of a carb-heavy meal, not getting enough sleep the night before, or not drinking enough water. And there's one more possible reason. There's a small region in your brain that controls your internal body clock, also called circadian rhythm. This part sends signals to your body to release melatonin, a snooze-inducing hormone. This way, it makes you feel sleepy and lowers your body temperature too. You go through a miniature version of this process somewhere between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. too. We still don't know why. 
But some researchers think it could be because our circadian rhythm has both a primary 24-hour cycle and a 12-hour one. You may feel like the best ideas come to your mind when you're trying to fall asleep. The transition from the point where you're awake to where you're asleep is called the hypnagogic state. Scientists believe it could be related to creativity. Mary Shelley said that the idea for her popular novel, Frankenstein, occurred during the waking dream stage. Salvador Dali, a famous artist, called this phase the slumber with a key. In this state, your mind feels free to wander and has no mobile phones, other people, or something else that can disrupt it. That's why it has more space for some spontaneous ideas and creative thoughts. If you fall asleep right after you enter this state, you'll probably forget most of your inspirational ideas. So, keep a paper and pen by your bed, just in case. 98 degrees Fahrenheit is a temperature that feels hot, even though the human body is of the same temperature. Well, actually, this is about the average temperature of our core. Our skin is about 93 degrees Fahrenheit, but our fingers, toes, and face can be much colder. The receptors we have in our skin react to differences and changes in temperature. When you touch your bare stomach with your hand, the hand will register warmth, but it will be cooler for your stomach, even though both of them have skin temperature. Similar to that, if you put a finger in your mouth, the inside will feel way warmer to the finger than to your tongue. The future holds self-driving cars and flying taxis. In the past, however, we've transported a cat through an underground suction pipe, and it survived. Here's how it's all connected, and why we humans don't travel in tubes. So this American company named Hyperloop promised for years it would transport people incredibly fast through a vacuum system. Its ambitious plans included rapid trains, capable of traveling at speeds of 700 miles per hour. By comparison, the passenger trains we have available these days can travel on average just 50 to 100 miles per hour. But to everyone's surprise, the company closed down last year. Even though they made prototypes in the Nevada desert, the project had many problems. They needed to build huge tubes that would have been scattered around, even through cities. And the trains couldn't handle turns very well, so the tubes had to be straight. In 2020, the company did a test run with two people, going at 107 miles per hour. It was the first successful ride using this technology. Despite this initial success, the company soon announced they'd focus on moving objects instead of people. Does this mean we'll never be able to use this type of transportation for people? Let's look at it historically. Pneumatic tube transport relies on air pressure to push things through pipes. Back in the day, it was used for sending messages and moving small objects in big buildings. Even today, places like hospitals, banks, and stores still use it to quickly send things like medicine and money. Here's how it works. Say you run a store with cash registers. Instead of risking theft by walking cash to a safe, you can send it through tubes. Each register connects to a tube that leads to a safe or cashier's office. All objects would be transported through canisters. They'd snugly fit in the mechanism, then get sucked by a vacuum created by a compressor. Canisters are often sturdy cylindrical boxes made of tough plastic, carrying items weighing up to about 5 pounds and traveling at speeds up to 22 miles per hour. There are limitations to consider. Installing pneumatic tube systems in existing buildings can be challenging, as they require careful planning during the initial design phase. There's also the risk of valuable items becoming stuck or damaged during transport. You can't move around objects that are larger than 5 pounds or so, so it doesn't eliminate the need for manual labor. For more than half a century, until 1953, the New York City Post Office used a similar system to transport its mail. It was based on pipes that ran underground up to 6 feet below the city streets. Because it had revolutionary speeds at the time, the people who operated the system were nicknamed Rocketeers. At its busiest, this tube system handled almost 100,000 letters every day, which was a third of all the city mail. The first thing they sent through these tubes was a book wrapped in a flag, along with copies of important country documents. Other funnier objects are rumored to have been sent through this system, 
including a fake peach meant as a joke or a sandwich. They even sent a cat through one of the tubes once. It's hard to imagine how the cat made it through the system at such a high speed, but it did. Local authorities soon had to let go of this project, though, because of the costs. The New York population also grew larger, and the number of letters became overwhelming for these small tubes. Hyperloop's idea was to transport people using the same principles. Cool as it sounds, it's not new. Images with similar concepts date back to the 19th century. Some say the idea hasn't been properly studied in the 20th century because large companies are more interested in selling cars. But even with modern technology, a pneumatic tube train is hard to build, mostly because it involves multiple engineering areas and it's expensive. Getting permits would also be difficult. Another issue is that compressed air that's being pushed through a small area translates to a lot of heat. So cooling systems need to be worked into these plants. One potential solution was to put a water tank in each train to catch the heat and turn it into steam at the next stop. Even if the science makes sense on paper, in reality, there's not a lot of space in the small train for a good heat exchange. This means more water, which means more weight, which in turn means less speed. One Asian company, however, claims to have created the fastest pneumatic train earlier this year. In theory, this device could transport someone from New York to Los Angeles in under an hour, or from London to Paris in just 15 minutes. To prove their efforts, they set up a mile-long testing track where the prototype train reached 387 miles per hour. The company considers this test a success, affirming that it proved the seamless interaction between the test tube, vehicle, and track. As they were developing the project, they uncovered troubles of their own. A power outage, leak, fire, or even a simple human error could lead to a disastrous accident. More so, the train's high speed and rapid acceleration could induce discomfort among passengers. Hyperloop trains aside, what might the future of getting around look like? Better ways of moving from one place to another could make our lives easier by reducing time, expenses, and accidents. One idea could be fast trains that float. These speedy vehicles might use strong magnets to hover above the tracks, letting them go fast while making less noise and shaking than regular trains. They're also less likely to get stuck because they don't rub against the tracks as much. These trains also don't need gas, so they're better in terms of resources as well. Instead of engines, they use magnetic fields made by special coils in the walls and tracks to push them forward. Right now, six of these lines are up and running in Asia, but soon they might appear in the U.S. too. The first one is planned to connect Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, and later, it might stretch all the way to New York. About 20 companies are also exploring the idea of flying taxis. They could transport people in cities with the help of small planes. The idea is to offer safe rides at a fair price, like a $70 trip from Manhattan to Kennedy Airport without bothering those on the ground below. Challenges here include reducing flight expenses, increased urban noise, and drafting rules about flying over busy cities. Even though some people are still nervous about the idea, it seems that driverless cars are on the way to becoming a reality. Many automobile companies are testing out their prototypes, even though there are still questions about how safe they can be. We don't know yet if the same rules should apply to them as the ones for human drivers. Lots of accidents happen because drivers aren't paying attention, but robots don't get distracted. Driverless cars are supposed to take fewer risks and go slower to keep everyone safe. On the downside, they're expensive, with prices expected to be over $100,000 apiece. Projects including delivery drones have already been implemented too. For instance, a UPS drone brought medicine to people's homes in the U.S. after getting approval from the Federal Aviation Administration. It was a big step forward for drones, even though there are still rules to sort out before they can be used on a larger scale. Drones have to prove they're safe before they can fly freely over people's heads. So for now, UPS is only using them in rural areas and around hospitals. To solve traffic jams, we might turn to building roads underground and driving our cars through tunnels. This could work better than flying cars, because the process is not affected by the weather. One plan is to lower cars down with a big elevator and allow them to circulate on a fast metal platform. The advantages may include faster speeds, since there are fewer risks of accidents, 
from things like wild animals crossing the road. It also might be less expensive, since people are less likely to be stuck in traffic. Not to mention our cities might end up looking a little prettier and less noisy. Our estimated flight time today will be three days. Future passengers of the world's longest aircraft, Airlander 10, won't get to their destinations quickly, but they will surely do it in style. Nicknamed the Flying Bum for its unconventional exterior, this plane will feature plush ensuite bedrooms, an onboard altitude bar, and glass flooring with horizon to horizon views. Airlander 10 won't even need an airport. It can take off and land from any flat surface, be it land, sand, water, or ice, using pneumatic skids. It will also be friendly to the environment with less emissions and is supposed to become the safest form of air travel. This 300-foot-long engineering marvel is part airship, part helicopter, and part plane. Other aircraft use one of the various methods to maintain flight – buoyancy, vertical thrust, or lift. Blimps, helicopters, and planes mostly rely on buoyancy, vertical thrust, and lift respectively. But our bum plane incorporates all three of these principles. First comes buoyancy. Airlander uses a massive amount of helium, a material less dense than air. It helps aircraft like blimps and zeppelins take off, just like how a helium-filled balloon ascends. And because helium is buoyant on its own, our hero can float effortlessly. Airlander stores its helium in several compartments for safety and also has four 325-horsepower engines and requires way less power compared to conventional aircraft, like the Boeing 787, which makes it more energy efficient. But this buoyant aircraft is limited in payload, up to 10 tons. Its constructors could make the hull bigger to place more helium in it, but our plane is already the bulkiest in the world, so that would be too much. To help with this, the Airlander 10 is equipped with two vertical thrusters, like those on helicopters. They direct the air downwards, lifting the aircraft. And then there's lift, which plays a crucial role in the aerodynamics of flight. To get lift, you need air zipping over and around the wing, creating a force. Even though the Airlander might not have monster engines like a big jetliner, its huge hull gives plenty of space for air to do its thing and help it lift off. This unique hybrid aircraft has run several successful test voyages, so you can consider it a real thing. It will be a customizable transformer, good for passenger travel, cargo transport, extended flight operations, or scientific goals. Some of its configurations will be able to stay in flight for up to five days without stopping. It could be really useful for research missions. And the designers plan to build an even bigger Airlander 50 with a capacity of 50 tons of payload. In the early days of aviation, there were no computer simulations to test the design, so there were some pretty crazy plane models built. Italian designer Gianni Caproni wanted to create an aircraft to transport 100 passengers across the Atlantic with comfort and style. His brainchild, Ka-60, had nine wings arranged in three sets of three. It had eight engines, all serviced by mechanics in flight. There were panoramic windows along both sides of the long cabin for passengers sitting in two wide rows to enjoy the views of the world below. It had a rounded nose, an integral flight deck, and a streamlined seaplane hull. Once the plane was finished, the pilot was doing test runs on Lake Maggiore to balance the hydroplane. Then, there was probably a boat in its path, or the pilot went too fast, and the plane took off when it wasn't supposed to. It broke up. By the time Caproni arrived at the lake, the pilot had been rescued, but trying to pull the wreckage out only made things worse. So, the plane never got to cross the Atlantic. The French engineers went even further and designed a plane with a body modeled after birds and named it Duck. It was supposed to have a steam engine to power a single tractor propeller to the front of its rotund body. The pilot and landing gear were supposed to be attached by cables and frame underneath the body. This weirdly looking aircraft had an official name, but everyone remembered it as the Flying Pancake because of its saucer-like shape. This design was supposed to make it possible to land and take off in tight areas where regular planes can't fit. The prototype was a success with low takeoff and landing speeds, and the disc-shaped design helped generate lift. The engineers received funding for an improved version, but it came with flaws. When they were corrected, 
there was no longer a need for this quirky plane. German aeronautical engineer Alexander Lippisch came up with the Aerodyne. It looks like the rear part of an airplane after cutting the whole thing in half, but it could fly on its own. It was considered a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the same group as helicopters. It combined lift and thrust using a single unit and flow channel, like a ducted fan. Flaps at the end of the fan would divert the outflowing air. The first Dornier Aerodyne flight took off in 1972. Even though it was a success, the authorities lost interest in it and shelved the project. The Pregnant Guppy, also known as Frankenplane because it was made of parts of other airplanes, has helped NASA on its way to the moon. Back in the 1960s, they had a problem shipping rockets from the West Coast to Cape Canaveral in Florida. Taking them by water through the Panama Canal took two to three weeks, and fragile parts came dented and corroded. And that's when John Conroy came up with a solution. His friend had Boeings he had bought but didn't find use for them. Conroy decided to modify the planes by adding a larger cargo bay on top of the fuselage. He didn't receive funding from NASA for his idea, but he never gave up and mortgaged his own house, sold his car, and invested all his savings into his project to prove it would work out. He borrowed the fuel to fly the prototype to Alabama. The plane flew perfectly and impressed everyone. The Super Guppy, as they started calling it, was successfully transporting rocket stages for NASA's Gemini program. Conroy built a total of 25 modifications of his aircraft to fit even larger and heavier equipment. The Edgley Optica EA-7 might look like a funky, futuristic dragonfly aircraft, but it was designed in the mid-70s for low and slow surveillance or sightseeing missions. It features a helicopter-like cockpit mounted ahead of a ducted fan motor and an impressive 270-degree field of view. Its large ducted fan was running quietly inside and outside the cockpit. It gained renewed interest in the 21st century for border patrol, wildlife management, and fire spotting missions. But because of lack of funding, there were only five out of the 22 built aircraft remaining airworthy worldwide. Have you ever seen a plane with two fuselages of differing sizes? The Rutan Model 202 Boomerang stands out as a multi-engine aircraft built this way to minimize the risks of engine failure. Unlike conventional planes, even if one of its engines were to malfunction, the Boomerang remains easily controllable thanks to its innovative design, which effectively manages asymmetric thrust. This design makes the Boomerang faster and more efficient. This plane was never designed for commercial use, but as a private plane for up to five people. You can tell that this short sky van was built for practical purposes without caring too much about aesthetics, just by looking at it. And that's how this general purpose aircraft got its nicknames like Flying Shoebox and The Shed. Despite all the mocking, the sky van has served well over the years. It's been around since its first flight in the 1960s, still transferring cargo and passengers today. It can seat 19 people and has a van-like large rear door for loading and unloading freight. That's why it's perfect for short-haul flights, activities like skydiving, and much more. Even the smartest folks make vital home security mistakes, such as using combination locks. Well, that means dummies like me are in real trouble. There's no denying combination locks are convenient. You don't need to worry about losing the key or anything. But one of the biggest problems combination locks have is that they can be cracked through trial and error. And you don't need to be Danny Ocean to do that. Try enough times and you'll be able to unlock one. So, convenience? It comes at a cost of security. This is all due to the mechanics of how these locks work. Inside a combination lock, there are several rotating discs. Each of these is aligned with a number on the dial. When you enter the correct combination, these internal components align perfectly, creating a clear path that allows the lock to open. This simplicity, however, is also their Achilles heel. The reliance on a fixed numeric code means that anyone with time and patience can attempt a brute force approach, methodically trying different combinations until they stumble upon the correct one. That's why combination locks offer a more predictable and therefore exploitable challenge to potential intruders. Moreover, there are other practical limitations. 
Some combination locks may not be as resistant to extreme weather conditions, such as rain, snow, or freezing temperatures, which can affect their performance and reliability. Additionally, entering a combination can be slower than using a key, potentially inconvenient or problematic in emergencies or situations where quick access is required. With that, I am by no means suggesting that you can put your trust in other types of locks. All come with their own weaknesses. Now let's take key locks next. At first glance, with their unique physical keys and intricate internal mechanisms, they appear to offer a higher degree of security. Sure, their complex design with pins that must align perfectly with the key's cuts seems to provide a sturdy safeguard against intruders. But the truth is keyed locks can be vulnerable to various bypass methods, including lock picking, a skill that determined intruders can easily master. Additionally, they make way for mistakes within a mistake. Talk about security inception. The common practice of hiding spare keys around the home, like under the doormat or stones, significantly weakens the security key uh-huh. locks often. There's also the risk of keys being duplicated without the owner's knowledge. And even if you are careful not to leave your key anywhere or give it to anyone, there's also the possibility that an intruder might try to break the lock. If the thief has strong muscles and knows you will not be home for a while, then kiss your valuable belongings goodbye. Now, how about key safe locks? You know, the ones that people use for rental apartments? These devices are typically mounted to a wall or other secure surface and can be accessed only by entering a correct code. They provide a secure place to store your keys, eliminating the risky game of hide-and-seek with your spare keys under flower pots. Sounds like a solid plan, right? Well, before you heave a sigh of relief, it's important to remember our mantra. No lock is impenetrable. Eh, here's the word I'm trying to say. Anyways, key lock safes are not only susceptible to brute force attacks, but also susceptible to the same risk as combination locks. Furthermore, the very visibility of a key safe can sometimes be a giveaway to burglars that you're security conscious, potentially making your home a more tempting target. It's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? But the worst part is even a piece of paper might be enough to open them. Key lock safes typically consist of several rotating wheels inside the lock. Each wheel has a small notch known as a gate. When you dial in the combination, you're actually rotating these wheels. The correct combination aligns all the gates in a straight line. Once aligned, a bar or lever inside the lock, called the fence, drops into these aligned gates and the lock can be opened. The intruders might be able to figure out the configuration on key lock safes using a thin piece of paper. And the rest of the process involves some mathematical skills as well as lots of luck. But since this whole thing will take quite some time, it's likely someone will be able to spot them before they succeed. So, is there a lock that you can fully trust to keep the bad guys at bay? Enter the era of digital door locks. This seemingly futuristic solution comes equipped with features like fingerprint recognition, keypads with unique pin codes, and even remote access through your smartphone. But wait before you run down to the tech stores to get one. It's crucial to recognize that while digital locks can offer enhanced security features like tamper alerts and the ability to change codes on a whim, they're not without their own vulnerabilities. For instance, electronic locks can be susceptible to technical glitches, hacking, or battery failures. Another new tech lock type is biometric locks. They sound like they belong to spy movies, but they're actually quite handy. Instead of using keys or codes, these locks use parts of your body, like your fingerprint, your face, or even your eyes to unlock doors. This way, they provide protection against key thefts, code losses, ripping, melting, drilling, and hacking. In addition, some safes have an opening delay and automatic blocking in the event of an unsuccessful entry. This makes biometric locks the most secure on the market. However, they come with a hefty price tag, as they're among the most expensive types. But there's more to consider beyond the price tag before investing in one. For example, if the fingerprint or facial recognition features fail, these locks also come with backup options like a keypad or a regular key that will allow you to open them. In addition, they require maintenance every now and then. 
Remember, they run on batteries, so you'll have to replace them once in a while. You'll also need to clean the locks, especially the fingerprint part, to ensure they recognize you every time. And let's not forget the privacy issue. Storing your personal biometric info into a lock does raise a few eyebrows for some folks. You see, no lock is totally perfect. But the key to home security isn't just in the lock you choose, it's also in taking some other simple precautions as well. For example, you might be one of the loners who prefers to keep their daily life to themselves. But for security reasons, it would be wise to consider making some friends in your neighborhood. You see, engaging with neighbors and participating in a neighborhood watch program can enhance security too. When you're going away, you can let your community know. In this way, the alert neighbors can report any suspicious activity they see around your house. Valuables that are easily seen through windows or left unguarded in the yard can attract unwanted attention. Make sure to keep expensive items out of sight and use curtains or blinds effectively to reduce this risk. Many homeowners overlook securing second-floor windows and doors, assuming they are inaccessible. However, burglars can find creative ways to reach these points. Leave no ladder or any other equipment that will allow the thieves to climb your house and secure every floor. Failing to update or maintain your home security system can leave it vulnerable to tampering or disablement. Make sure to get regular maintenance and updates to ensure it functions effectively. Poor outdoor lighting provides cover for burglars to approach unseen. Hmm. Try solutions such as installing motion sensor lights and ensuring the exterior of your house is well lit to deter potential intruders. You also need to consider the fact that no matter how many security measures you take, there's always the possibility of a thief being able to bypass them and enter your home. That's why you should have a safe in your house. It's a secondary line of defense that's often overlooked, but in the case of a break-in, a secure safe can help you protect valuable documents, jewelry, and other irreplaceable items. And lastly, an often overlooked aspect of home security is digital. If your Wi-Fi network is unsecured, this can be a gateway for cyber criminals to access your personal information in smart home devices. Using a strong password and considering advanced security measures can be beneficial to avoid that. Or you can just get a dog with a really loud bark. Hey, works for me. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on